Welcome everybody to the LinkedIn for B2B Growth Show. I'm your host, Michelle J. Raymond, and I am joined by someone whose content fascinates me. Stephen G. Pope, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. How did you end up here talking about creating content systems and really taking people from overwhelm to a place where content's easy. Yeah, I will say that some people are still overwhelmed by some of the stuff I do, but there's a large portion of people that also dig it too. And so I started running across people that were building these like high ticket consulting businesses and off the internet and people like Gary Vee doing video and content and social media. And I just got pretty fascinated with that. I didn't set out to build content systems. It just turns out that I'm really good at that because as soon as I started getting into all this, I just started running into all the roadblocks that everybody does. But I had the ability to solve those on my own and start to build things. And then I started to just make content around it just for fun. I'd be like, hey, check out this content system. Check out this. I made some TikToks and, and, and LinkedIn videos. And people were just like, hey, can I buy that? And then it just pretty much turned into a product through that evolution. So that's like how I got here. That's really interesting because I have been creating content for around eight or nine years now. And historically, it was as an employee. It wasn't part of my official job. It was just something that I started to do in my sales role because I realized I could speak to way more people all at once and start to build up a reputation in an industry that I was really new at. But then fast forward, set up my business, have no idea what I'm doing as far as who I'm going to sell to, what I'm going to sell starting back, building a whole new community, starting back, building all my authority again. In the nine years that I've been creating content, I literally would think, I don't think I've really saved any content anywhere strategically. I don't think I've had a really good system for repurposing, although that's probably happened in the last six months. So I just think about the amount of time and effort that I put into creating some amazing content along the way that has just disappeared Right. down the toilet, as I right. call it, because the LinkedIn feed refreshes every 48 hours. There goes Michelle's content. And even if we look at things like podcasts or YouTube, even that, it's all about being discovered and it gathers dust. And so I wanted to talk to you because I think there's a real opportunity for everyday people. You don't have to have the Gary V, Alex Hormozy big teams. I've watched what you've created, which applies to anyone and everyone, which has just been brilliant. But do you remember, was there an actual moment that you recall as a content creator yourself that you realized that these manual processes just weren't working for you? Yeah, I do remember the first time I started to build out some systems in Airtable. I I remember me and my wife were sitting in bed and I was just consumed with all of these. I think at first I had just created a simple Notion page to keep track of things, which was working, but I just was copying links here and there. And I was sitting there with my wife and then I was like, you know what, if I used Airtable and some of these Zapier automations, I could just be saving these links for myself and keeping them organized. And that was really the beginning. So it's just like creating folders and keeping track of links is probably one of the core things that you can do that will then allow you a lot of flexibility down the road. So it was just as simple as that. We created this little Airtable database that we used. It was clunky and we used it for quite a while. And so, yeah, I remember exactly when. Yeah, I think we've got a mutual friend and connection, Eric Levy, who absolutely started Mm. down this process with me a little while back. And I started to do it and then life happened. I got sidetracked. But ultimately, it was like one of those things that for me, it's just the more you can put automations and and tools that actually do this properly for you, this is where I think, you know, you can get that traction. And Hmm. automation is a word that typically online at the moment probably has a lot of negative connotations. But the way that you use it, is really, it can, really, yeah, definitely really can. powerful. And I know you've said online that we can't just automate everything. There are parts of this process that you can't just hand over to a tool. Do you want to expand I, on I'm that? I'm so glad that you've caught that part of the message because some people don't. This might sound a little odd, but I don't actually love systems. I'm an engineer, so I like building solutions to problems. And so it just so happens that it seems like I'm very systematic. But I actually fight against systems a lot of the time. I feel like they're restrictive and they hold you back. So sometimes like just light systems that kind of give you a framework is actually a better thing because being thoughtful and having enough time to articulate a message or review something or kind of think about the pain points that your clients are having. Some of these things, if you systemize too much, you try to automate too much, 
you're going to remove the life blood from your message. I love the duality of things. You got to do things at scale, but at the same time, it has to be just the best. It has to be the best content and you do it at scale. That's the true power, in my opinion. There is a big danger with that. And I can always sense from people when they're coming to me just for the automation things. I like to make sure that it's not just about that. I took on the mindset that there are pieces in my business that if I automated processes or parts of, then I could actually free my time up because I don't want to have any other employees besides Lil and I working together so that I could free myself up to focus on things that matter, i.e. customer relations, delivering training, doing the things that I'm really good at, and then making sure that if there were things that were really consuming my brain. I remember having a conversation with Eric going, do you know that when I produce a podcast, when I actually mapped it out, there was, I'm going to call it 25 to 30 different steps within that, of which my brain was trying to keep up that number of steps for every podcast episode. And I've got multiple ones running at a time. And the podcast is such a small piece of everything that I do. But my brain was full with just trying to remember where things were up to, which is how I started this. But now my brain doesn't remember those kinds of things. It remembers, reach out, have a connection, have a conversation and do these kinds of things. It was really crazy when I sat down, and I think that's something that I would feed back to our listeners today, is you have to take time out and sit down and think about these things. Because if you just keep on, I guess, the hamster wheel running all the time, you will end up being the bottleneck in your business, which is where I was headed. It was fine in the early days. I had plenty of time, Stephen. I could sit back. I could take as long as I wanted to do anything. But as my business grew and it doubled and then, you know, another 30% on top of that, and it just kept going that way, all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, this is (laughs) not going to happen long term. And I want to make more money. No apologies for that. I'm here to make as much money as I can from the time that I invest in this process. So For me, I love what you do. It's yes, the processes are here, but don't lose sight of what's important. And I think that's a key piece of what you put out there that I love. Otherwise, I think I would be repelled by that kind of stuff. It's good that you noticed that too, because I don't take this personally, but there are people that are repelled by some of my content. They're like, hey, when I see your videos, like I'm overwhelmed. And at first, what's really interesting, and this is like a little bit of a side topic, but I remember originally I was like, I I think that's a good thing because I would put out some of these TikToks and some of them would go really viral, like hundreds of thousands of views. And some people were just like, that is so cool. And like, there were other people that were just like, that was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Like, I can't imagine implementing something like that. That was interesting to me. I was like, oh, wow, some people are really put off by this. But I can see why, because I know those types of people are really focused on, I don't know how to put it, but they're just focused on like creating good quality stuff. And just seeing that some people are just like, there's no way you're making quality if you're doing all that. I have bumped up against those different things. At the same time, I'm telling you to make good quality and do it at scale. There are times when I've had less quality and more scale. And then I've had more quality. So it's, it's this ebb and flow. And I, I've always just loved that duality of things, trying to do both. Like it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be and. And I always love when people experiment with things. I think that's an important piece of content creation is trying new things, learning from them, what worked, what didn't work, instead of getting stuck in a rut and things aren't working. And then people get paralyzed. But are there any other common misconceptions that people might hold about automations, Mm. you know, specifically around LinkedIn content creation that you'd like to say something to that? Yeah. I think if you're new to content creation, usually when people think automation, they think of the auto publishing part of content. And I do use auto publishing here and there depending, but that's not the main message that I have, especially like on any platform you're trying to grow on. Like you probably don't really want to do the auto posting as much. From my experience, when you do auto posting, it does affect the reach of your content. The platforms want you there. So if you're not going to show up, they'll publish it, but they're just not going to give it to as many people. So that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions. That's the easiest part of the whole process, really. If everything's organized from the beginning all the way up to the point where you publish, the publishing, it's annoying, but it's not that big of a deal. Now, it's going to be more annoying if you're not organized and you're like in three different folders trying to get a video out the door. But I think that's probably the biggest one is my automation is all about front-loading everything and keeping organized and automated all the way through. Not so much about that final piece, which is the auto-posting, which is annoying, but not the hardest part. I think also, and I have the equivalent in what I do, 
is when people reach out to me and they're like, Michelle, do you do lead generation? And Mm. I automatically get triggered by that and think, oh my God, they want one of those automation tools where it spans 50 million people all at once and we hope and pray that someone responds. And so (laughs) I've had to sit back and think about that lately and just go, okay, of course, every business wants new leads to grow their business. I don't do the lead generation where it's on autopilot, but I do help people generate leads for their business is why I'm here. I can see how you would end up against that when we don't get to work with anyone and everyone. That's just not what life's about. It's not what business exists for. But if a business is listening into the podcast and they're just starting out with automation and content creation, what are the first steps that you think they should take to set themselves up for success? If you have some technical skills and it's not going to take you a long time, setting up some basic automations that will help you keep organized are definitely going to be worth it. If you don't know anything about tech and you haven't created a lot of content, you're going to waste a bunch of time trying to set all that up. If you're just a tech wizard, have some fun and go create some stuff that's going to keep you organized and then just go create content. If it's going to get you distracted and you're going to get you're going to get errors and you're going to just waste a bunch of time, then just don't even worry about the automation and just go create some cool content because you can make money with content without any automation. Absolutely. Or they could also go to you and grab one of your programs because you've done all the work for them. So I'll make sure that I put all those details in the show notes for the listeners as well. So we can cut out some of that learning experience. You've already done the trialing and testing. Do you recommend people do any kind of planning or mapping? Is there anything else they should be doing or can they literally just come to you by the system and ta-da, away we go. The person that's going to get the most out of my system is somebody that's already creating content. Some of my best customers, they already create a lot. In, in terms of just this content system, this automated system, right? A lot of them aren't necessarily looking for content strategy or how do I create content? How do I get on video? That kind of thing. They're already creating a lot. In fact, some of my clients are like video agencies, right? So they create a bunch of video for their clients. And for them, it's they're just swimming in videos with all these different clients. And so they just need help organizing all that. And there are some people that buy it when they're early to the content creation. Usually they're just a little bit more tech savvy. I try to suss that out a little bit too, just so I know that they're not going to go down some rabbit hole and just create this big system and then not put anything through it. I could imagine that you would end up with some people that are having fun playing around in your systems and not actually putting content out there, but obsessed with learning how that process can work. Yeah, there's and- a few. That's okay too. Like it's, I'm always sussing out the intention, right? I'll ask people, are you creating content? And they're like, no. And I'm like, do you just want to nerd out on some cool tech? And they're like, yeah. And I say, okay, then buy it, right? If if you were to tell me like, no, I I just want to create, then I would say, just go create a little bit, get some momentum and then put like a real powerful system in place that can help you scale. I know when I first set up my business and I was looking at different pieces of tech around there at this stage, it was before we'd had the conversation about AI, which is all we've had this year. Going back almost two years, it wasn't quite so prevalent. And so I found a product called Lately AI, Mm. which was really great at taking long content and turning it into short pieces and getting my tone of voice and all this kind of cool stuff, which I loved. But then I realized, yes, it was a great product and it's fabulous. But the problem was I was nowhere near ready for that in my own business. I had no long form content. I wasn't writing long form blogs or YouTube videos or these LinkedIn live podcasts. I wasn't doing anything that I could get the value out of repurposing. So effectively, it ended up being a really expensive, cool piece of tech that I still think is amazing, but it just wasn't right for me. So I jumped in too early. And I, I think that's the cautionary tale aligned with what you just said is that Sometimes you just got to get out there and start trialing these things. Walk before you run, so to speak. Yeah, like marketing technology specifically, they're good at getting you to buy things that may not be good for you, partly because maybe you're not ready for it and partly because maybe you shouldn't actually be doing it. Look, it was one of those things that, you know, and I've tried a lot of things. That's just one of the products that I loved. And there's many more that I've had subscriptions for several months, not used it. And then had to go back and say, look, I'm just not at that point for this. My business is growing, building everything from scratch. So there's a lot of moving pieces all the time. And so what I've learned in year three is that I'm going in. So, okay, what is the number one project? Let's nail that and then move on to the next ones so that I can actually get the most use out of it. But as a a big content creator, I, I have a lot of content in a lot of different places. And so now I think that next evolution for me, which has been beginning this year, has been, look, 
how can I reuse that to save some of my time down the track? Before we jump into the power of repurposing, there will be people that are listening and they're, they're going to be going, but Stephen, what about the tools? What do you use? So can you just give us a quick overview of the specific tools or systems that have been game changers for you in streamlining some of these processes? I know you've mentioned Airtable. That's something I've just become friends with this year. But what else do you play around with? Yeah. And just for people that might not know, Airtable is pretty much like a spreadsheet on steroids. It acts a lot like a database. That's where we get a lot of power for content creation because then you really get to, on a very granular level, keep track of all of the content. Like you literally have like direct links to every single image and document and video. And then that becomes this repository that you can pull from very easily. So I use Airtable and then the product I use primarily uses Airtable, Zapier, Google Drive, and Frame.io. Frame.io is a video collaboration tool. So when you're working with your video editors, you can give them feedback. Zapier is just an automation tool that lets you, it's like the glue of the internet, they say, that lets you just connect different tools. And Google Drive is just a storage engine, right? So we're putting all these things together so that you have a single source of truth for all your content. And then one thing about Airtable that's also cool is that along the left side, you can create all these different views and you basically can filter the content based off of those views. And those views then allow you to facilitate different workflows. And so between all of these different tools, you can essentially just build whatever you need. Oh, I can't even tell you how much I'm going to call it fun in inverted commas I had when I was working by myself for a good chunk of the time that the business was growing. Lots of stuff was caught in my head. And then when Lil started working in the business with me, all of a sudden she's like, where do I find this? Where is that? How do you know that? And I just realized, no wonder I felt tired all the time because my brain was just exploding with trying to remember everything. And whilst I'd written some procedures and bits and pieces, the fact was there was nowhere that an external person could come in, regardless of who it was, and find out how do I find this stuff? Where do I find this stuff? Where should I save it if I'm working on something? How do we let each other know that something's been done? Now we work in close proximity. So the number of times of, Michelle, where's this? Lil, have you done that? Michelle, where should I save this? That backwards and forwards ping pong, I didn't realize how often that was going to happen. And that is exactly why I started investing in this piece of my business. Because I was like, I can't scale. Even if I don't want employees, there might be contractors that I want to work with. I can't do that if it's all in my head. And I think that's the thing, the evolution for my business has been, if you want to scale, you want to grow your business, you can't just keep everything in your head. And it sounds silly. And I, I know as a human being and a logical person back in the beginning, that totally makes sense. But the reality of trying to build everything from scratch, like I said, just juggling so much all day, every day. And so this is why I think that for me now, when my brain is full of that, I can't create good content because my brain is at capacity and I liken it to a computer that's got only so much RAM and storage space. And if it's full, you can't do anything else. So that's what it's been like for me. Can you relate to things like that with your clients? The only time I can really create good content is if I kind of sit down and have some thoughtful time. Unless I'm on a podcast or an interview, it's like when you're in the moment with someone, it's a little easier, although that sometimes has a little less direction. Although if you plan things right, maybe not. But yeah, you got to have mental space to, to do creative stuff. Yeah. And that's why I'm investing, as I said, into this kind of thing, because I just realized my poor brain, I've got to look after it. There's two things that are good for content creation, freeing up space in your mind and a good night's sleep. Yeah. That, in my experience, is better than any other you know, copywriting course or anything else like that. Have a good night's sleep. You'll be surprised what that does. I think we're always trying to find some secret or some process or some thing. And what it really is, is, are you thoughtfully working on the right stuff? I couldn't agree with that more. I think it's for me always getting back to the basics and been going through a bit of a phase of something that Tuomo, who was a guest on my podcast back in the very beginning, he's a high performance mindset coach. And the thing that stuck with me back then was simplification leads to mastery. So do fewer things, but do them really well. And I guess that's what I've been trying to do in business, strip back things that I don't need to focus on, get really good at the things that I do. And this kind of systems and processes and automation is a part of it. It doesn't need to be, but 
all of these kinds of things is what makes me better at the things that I, I really want to create when I'm creating content. So the thing that I want to talk to you about, which is I think really the power of your system is repurposing. Now, do you plan content specifically knowing that it's going to be repurposed or how does your process work from actually what kind of content and how you'll reuse it? So obviously if I go on a podcast or if I create a, anything that has any length to it, I will repurpose it. I'll create clips from this. I'll create clips from my YouTube video. Where I focus most of all is like, how do we make it so that all of the content is very usable and accessible? And, and th these are all concepts that I've continued to refine to make it easier. But let, let's think of a like a video post for a second. So you got the video. You might potentially have an image if it's a thumbnail for YouTube. Uh, and then you've got the 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 actual post description that you've written. Those are three separate pieces of content, right? You might think of that as just like one post, right? But realistically, you could take that image and make an image post out of it now. You could take that text and you could make that text a post without the video or the image. You could take that text and then you could turn it into tweets. So that's the way I think. And then I, I built the system so that it can function that way. So when I build out a, a YouTube video, it's really a collection of different pieces of content. And all of those individual pieces are stored in such a way that I can reuse those and just transform them into other pieces. And because they're so accessible, it's pretty easy for me to do that. So yeah, repurposing has to be a part of it. And you can change the format. You can change because like people just don't pay attention to you that much. So I can take a text post and then I can overlay it on an image. There's a million and a half different ways you can just take the same thing and do it. It takes a certain in the weeds mentality to to go and do it, to put it together, to have the mental framework on how to put these things together. Because a lot of things will get in your way. Things will just keep you from doing it. Or you just might be too busy. I, I, I try to make it as easy as possible. I build the system in a way that's very flexible and then just experimenting with how you can put all these different things together. I think when I've been looking at all of my content and these processes, and this particular podcast is recorded via LinkedIn Live, it will later on end up on YouTube, shorts, like different pieces of the puzzle, lots of newsletters or blogs or clips or all kinds of different bits and pieces. The part that I'm doing well is probably the repurposing as a concept and creating the right kinds of things that can. So every podcast episode has five questions, which theoretically I can then break down into five different posts and away we go from there. But what I haven't done is found a way to actually make that process, not me pulling out my hair. So you and I will definitely be talking when I'm finished with the website because Operation Rebrand, the website's the next thing and I don't want to nice. end up sidetracked. But <laughs> the question that I have for you, which I ask every podcast episode is, if someone has been listening in and they are overwhelmed with their content processes, do you have any last final tips that you would love to add that we ha may not have covered in the episode so far? Yeah, I think a lot of that overwhelm question is it's going to be a little different for everyone. So it's like I don't have the magic bullet. The magic bullet, though, in reality is just go sit down for a second and just really feel like, why are you getting overwhelmed? And the majority of the time, it's a lot of different things, but maybe it's just you're afraid of the camera or maybe you're just not giving yourself a good enough amount of time to write something thoughtful. So you don't even like it yourself. You're like, it's not good. So I think the, the biggest takeaway is I just, hey, go take a second. Go outside, take a deep breath. And what is overwhelming you? Just really like in the weeds, what's like making you feel the way you are? And then whatever that is, if it's something that you can solve on your own, just give yourself more time or slow down, give yourself a break, stop trying to do so much, make those decisions. Or if it's something that you're just missing a skill, then go address that, right? So if you just, you feel like you can't get on camera without someone's help, you don't know what equipment to buy you don't know how to write a script, go get somebody to teach you how to do that. There's like a zillion people that will show you how to do that. And there's a million YouTube videos that'll do it too. And you don't even have to pay anybody. So I think it's like that awareness, like, why are you really getting so overwhelmed with this? And then applying the probably pretty simple solution to that overwhelm. I think that advice is the best because typically when people come to me for like LinkedIn training in that piece and we're talking about creating content, coming at things from that perspective, it's normally fears that are getting in the way, fears it's all been said before, fears of being judged, fears people will think you're dumb, fears you're not good enough, not clever enough, not as creative, won't get as good numbers. When we wrote the LinkedIn branding book, the whole first chapter is about mindset. And I love that you've shared that. And I'm very confident that people were going to think that you would answer 
oh, go and learn this or do this or some kind of tech-based answer. So I love that (laughs) you've told people, actually, it's got nothing to do with that. It's time to go and do some reflections. If you told me, like, I'm trying to make a zillion pieces of content and and I'm just, I can't do it because of this or that, then I might talk about technology. But uh, yeah, what's funny about the whole mindset stuff and all of that, in a lot of ways, it's, and this is like the more like rude way to say it, but it's just get over yourself. Nobody's that clever. There's only a few people out there that just naturally get out there and are just like super clever. And it's like, just get over yourself and go help some people. I'm going to leave that there. Get over yourself (laughs) and go help some people. I think that's the perfect way to end the show. Stephen, thank you for everything you've shared today. As I said, I will be putting all your details in the show notes and I encourage people to follow your content, join your community, go and check out all of the stuff that you've already built because it could be the fast track to success for people who want to grow their business. 